and we're all born in dysfunctional families, and we all had parents that were carrying baggage, and some of that baggage got transmitted to us, and we all had experiences that messed us up, and it caused us to look at the world from the wrong perspective, so we all need to repent. If we're going to rediscover our evangelistic passion, we got to reclaim the message of repentance. And we got to get people to understand you need to repent. How many times have you and I had a conversation with somebody when we talked to them about the need for repentance? There are few and far, re 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 far between. We tell them you need to go to church, you need to accept Jesus, you need to get saved, and all those things are true. But we also need to point out, you need to repent. You need to change your mind about your own righteousness. You need to change your mind about your own condition. You need to change your mind about who God is. So it's only when we repent and we really see the darkness of our own souls and our own hearts and our own minds, it is repentance that causes us to cry out to God to have mercy on us. So repentance says, I am turning away from everything that I think, everything that I know. I'm just turning away from all of that, and I'm turning totally to God. See, a lot of Christian people, we think that coming to Christ means that we get what we want. No, no, no. Coming to Christ means we give up what we want. And now we only want what he wants. And we only, only receive what he has for us. Because then we got the long-range view in mind. We know that we do not have the spiritual intellect or savvy to know really what's best for us. We think we do, but we really don't. We do not know what is best for us. That's why we ought to be saying, Lord, whatever your will is. Now, I have to make a decision. I've got to make a step. But shut this door if it's not the right door for me to go through. Don't let me get the house if I shouldn't have the house. I done went out and signed my name on stuff and didn't even pray about it. So what the world did I do that for? I didn't even need that. As a matter of fact, my wife can tell you now, I don't even buy a pair of shoes. So I said, you think I really need them shoes? I think about it. Well, if I think about it about two or three days and I forget all about the shoes, that means I didn't need the shoes. <laughs> it really means I didn't need the shoes. But every now and then I think about it, and my feet say, well, you really do need the shoes. <laughs> my point is that, that we, don't all, we don't know what we really need. We don't know what's best for us. God knows. And so when we turn to him, we now are providing the hookup and the linkage that we need with the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God can now prompt us sometime in real time, not just in the right direction to take a step, or to kind of slow us down so we don't take another step, to keep us from a major disaster. We'll recapture our evangelistic zeal when we reclaim the message of repentance for our own lives and also for the lives of others. As Christians, we need to repent. We need to have times when we repent before God and say, Lord, I ain't been thinking about your will. I've been wanting what I want. I've been wanting a Burger King Christianity. I want to have it my way, and then I'll put in Jesus' name on the end. Okay, just, just putting Jesus' name on the end, and that's just going to make it all right. No, it don't work like that. And we repent before God, God can start to change and renew our minds. The second thing we've got to recapture, we've got to reclaim the message of repentance for our own lives and also in our evangelistic message. The second thing is we must recapture the biblical authority for deliverance. People are bound. They are bound up with addictions. They are bound with habits. People are bound with histories from the past. But the church does not have the biblical authority to help people find deliverance. And so we must recapture the biblical authority for deliverance right on the heels of Jesus preaching about repentance that they may receive the gospel, that they might enter into the kingdom of God, we see him encountering spiritually, de demonically possessed people, and he brings his biblical authority. Look at verse 21. 
Then they went into the Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. Now, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now, stop right there. Note what Jesus does. He goes into the synagogue. This is like a local church. The temple was in Jerusalem, but there were local synagogues that were scattered and dispersed all over the nation. The synagogues came into existence when the Jews were in Babylonian captivity after the temple had been destroyed. And so people went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as we would come to church today, and they went there to receive instruction from, from the book, from the rabbis and from the teachers, and for prayer, and to have their lives recalibrated around the Word of God. Now watch this. Jesus goes to the synagogue, and the first thing he does is that he teaches. He teaches. He lays out the plumb line. He establishes his authority. And his authority was not by how loud he was, how boisterous he, he was. His authority was based on the scripture and his knowledge and his understanding of the scripture. So he establishes his authority. And the Bible says after he had taught, the people were amazed. They were astonished. They were dumbfounded because he taught as one having authority. Now, the church, we got to make up our mind, do we believe that the Bible is the Word of God or do we not believe it's the Word of God? Because if we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then we are duty-bound to bring the authority of the Bible and the authority of the Word of God into situations and into circumstances. And we have to be authoritative where the Bible speaks. Now, if the Bible doesn't speak to an issue, then we say, well, the Bible doesn't speak directly to that issue. But here is the biblical principle that we're going to use to establish our position on that issue. But no, we're not having no great suggestion. Now, every, every idea does not have equal merit in the eyes of God. It's the ideas that most closely align with the Word of God. If ever there was a time for the church to speak, Authority. Even some of the issues that we are debating with and arguing with in local churches in the Kanoa Valley, few people are saying what the Bible says. They're saying what the denominations say, they're saying what Hilltop say, what the progressives say, what the Southern Baptists say. No, what does the Bible say? What does the scripture say? Now stand on the Bible and stand on the Bible alone all by itself and make your case, make your apologetic, make your defense based on the authority of scripture. And then if we disagree, we are disagreeing on the interpretation of the Bible and that's a legitimate disagreement to have. He establishes his authority, and he wanted the people to know that he spoke with the authority of God, and he appealed to the authority that they recognized, and that was the Old Testament text. But now what you find, when you don't have the authority of the Bible, guess where Satan is going to take up his residence? In the church, in the synagogue. Because if the Satan keeps the church crippled, over nonsense, over trivial stuff, and the church never rediscovers its authority and the power that it has to bring deliverance into the lives of people through the minister of the Word of God, through fasting and in prayer, then we've always been hung up on trivial stuff. So there in the synagogue, there was a man that was bound, he was demon-possessed, and the synagogue at Capernaum had absolutely no authority to help him at all at all. And that's what's happening today in our society. In our society, what we're finding is where there is a tough issue, the church says, well, we don't have the ability to do that. Well, why don't we don't? Why don't we have the authority to help people that are addicted to alcohol and to drugs? Why don't we have the authority? Why don't we have the authority to bring the word of God in prayer and fasting and accountability and discipline into the lives of people who are hung up on sexual perversion? If we don't have the authority, no one else certainly has it. Now, y'all listen to me. The world is aching for the church to stand up and say, this is the way, now let's walk together in it. So Jesus recaptures biblical authority. He brings it back to the synagogue and there's a showdown in the synagogue as to who has the power and who has the authority. 
So right there in the synagogue, this man that was demon-possessed, that's wreaking havoc in the synagogue,